automaker logos may be on the cars and trucks we buy, but many of those vehicles are created by Teamwork. Teamwork with Tier 1 suppliers. On today's show, we hear from two CEOs who tell us what business is like on the supply side. Underwriting for AutoLine this week has been provided by Borg Warner. And now, here's your host, John McElroy. I want to thank you all for joining us on AutoLine this week. You know, suppliers are the lifeblood of the automotive industry. Most people don't know this, but something like 70% of the value of a car is actually purchased by the car companies from suppliers. And when it comes to innovation, research and development, and creativity, most of the new ideas are really coming out of the supplier industry. This is one of the reasons why I've asked two supplier executives to join me today. In fact, we're going to get the view of what's going on in the automotive industry from tier one CEOs. And that's because two of my guests today include Lon Offenbacher, He's the CEO of a company called Intiva. They make closures, interiors, motors and electronics, and roof systems for cars. Rainer Ustock is the CEO of Federal Mogul Powertrain. He's also the co-CEO and co-chairman of Federal Mogul LLC. And of course, he's dealing with all kinds of things to do with powertrain, just as the title implies. And gentlemen, I want to thank both of you for joining me today. Thanks for having us. Let's start out talking about all kinds of things. Lon, I'm going to start with you. We've got this President Donald Trump who has really got the automotive industries in his crosshairs. He's talking about all different kinds of things that he wants to do about the automotive industry. I'm not trying to dig into your politics or anything like that, but what has President Trump done for you as a CEO as you try to plan out what you got to be doing with your business? Well, you know, uh, President Trump's agenda is pretty well known as far as what he's talking about, but I think these first hundred days is actually showing that he's, I think he's maturing in his understanding of kind of the dynamics of the economy and how some things may make sense, but they may make sense at a different, from a different angle. Um, and I know I've probably the biggest impact on me is as I travel, particularly amongst our customers and my own people. Um, I get all kinds of questions, you know, what's going to happen? And I really don't see, we're a global company, we're, we have 50 locations, five continents, 18 countries, so uh, everything we do, we hardly export anything in any country, so every place we are, we're serving the local market. So to some extent, it's not that intimidating. Now, where if a policy became really radical and it disrupted a, an entire region or an entire uh, country, and certainly Mexico comes in mind, then you might worry about it a little bit more. But I, I think the reality is, I think there's so much invested, there's, and it truly is a global economy, and it truly is a global industry, and you can't just pick on one leg of that stool and change the dynamics that quickly. And I want to get into more detail on that, but Rainer, same question to you. Yeah, same, same, same picture I have. Um, um, we got questions from our employees uh, in Mexico, especially. Uh, they have been, especially in the beginning, concerned uh, that uh, business might move away from Mexico uh, into the U.S. But we are in the same position. We are normally shipping from a location to customers close by. Uh, the cross-border for our company is relatively small. And I do believe that it's always good to review old contracts and whether it's a customer and a supplier or it's two, two countries. Um, and uh, what doesn't work for both parties should be changed. Um, but here yeah, I think it's, um, it's a well-established business between Mexico and the U.S. or Canada and the U.S. And there might be sm small changes, but I don't see uh, big disruptive uh, changes. So what do you think might happen with NAFTA? <laughs> I, I expect there, there, uh, there ought to be some tweaks. I mean, it really hasn't been touched uh, dramatically for a number of years. Uh, I was just in Canada, and uh, I didn't realize it, but we have two major tr uh, trade disputes going on. I, I had heard about the soft wood, but I didn't realize that there's also a milk yeah. problem. And Canada has a 270% tariff on imported milk and milk products. Um, that's probably not very fair, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I think there's, there are certainly some
announcements, some things that can be looked at. Uh, but in general, I think the uh, the trade structure uh, in NAFTA for the for the automotive industry works kind of well, you know. Mm -hmm. Yep. Rainer, you mentioned you think there might be some tweaks. What kind of tweaks do you think we might see? Yeah, I think um, maybe there are some adjustments for the Mequiladora system between the U.S. and Mexico, where you bring goods uh, free, of, uh, free of customs uh, through the border. But all of these seems to be smaller. I don't think um, it will be a big change. One of the things that's been talked about is, I hope I've got these numbers right, if you have 64% NAFTA content in your car, then you can sell that car in the US, Canada, or Mexico with no tariffs whatsoever. There's been talk of maybe raising that to about 75% or so local content. If that happens, would that affect any of your business? Um, I saw similar numbers and I heard that uh, especially the Japanese cars have the highest uh, local content in NAFTA. Hmm. So um, Toyota is uh, probably uh, uh, with more local content in some of their cars than uh, GM. Uh, but I don't see uh, my business uh, impacted because um, in the end, uh, we supply engine components and uh, in this calculation, the whole engine is counted. Mm -hmm. Brian? Yeah, I, I, I don't see any major differences. You know, I think that uh, where, it, where it could hit is uh, some of the subcomponents, uh, particularly like um, small electronics and things like this that, that might come from specialized um, areas of the of the world that have because of the cost structure uh, maybe a local industry has never developed you know and that that's the tricky part about tariffs right i mean if you if you have a unique mm -hmm. uh, structure if you have a unique technology and it happens to be in country a um, but it's not available in country b then all you're really doing is increasing the cost of the product to the consumer um, if there's a natural local indigenous uh, industry and you're like hurting them by importing or dumping, worst case, um, then certainly we should have better trade protection and, you know, a, a stronger backbone in those areas. One of the other things that's been talked about in the Trump administration is what they call a border adjustment tax. Mm -hmm. So if you're exporting something from the United States, your tax burden would be lowered. And for anybody importing anything into the U.S., your, your tax burden would go up. Uh, and again, would, do you think that might affect your business? Um, I think it would. Um, and it would probably uh, uh, impact especially the final price, uh, final sticker price of cars here in the U.S. Uh, because there is a net import uh, for cars uh, and car components in the U.S. Um, but so far as I have seen, uh, the latest um, tax proposal doesn't include these border tax any longer. So, mm -hmm. maybe so it may not happen. Maybe currently not in the, in the priorities. Uh -huh. Any thoughts on that, Lon? Well, you know, the, um, specifically in Mexico, they, you know, it's not technically part of NAFTA, but the Maquia Dora uh, laws that went into effect back in, I think, the late 70s um, have worked extremely effective because the whole idea is you import raw materials and then you export across with just basically the value add component of assembly or maybe some fabrication. Um, and what that actually has created is a, a fairly strong economy along the border employing Mexicans and creating a middle class in Mexico, which of course probably reduces the tendency to people who want to come across illegally. Mm -hmm. So, like I said earlier, it's a little bit of a tricky deal. You have to understand kind of the ebb and flow of what you're really doing if you really want to change those dynamics. You might get an unintended uh, effect. Yeah, it could easily happen. Let's talk about uh, the corporate average fuel economy regulations. Uh, they were, the bar was set pretty high that the industry would have to achieve 54.5 miles per gallon by the year 2025. Uh, there was supposed to be a midterm review where industry would comment on whether it think it could achieve that. And then under the Obama administration's last days, the EPA said, okay, no more midterm review. 
Now, uh, the new administration says it's, it's going to reinstate that. Rainer, I got to believe whichever way this goes is going to have a really big impact on your business because it's got to do so much with powertrain. Absol absolutely. Um, uh, for us, these cafe standards are driving our technologies and the technology of our customers. Um, for us, I do believe we will continue to uh, keep our timeline uh, from the development uh, because uh, you have still California, which currently says they will uh, stay with the uh, original timeline. Um, you have, I think, 13 other states in the US which stay on it. And you have uh, Europe with um, quite aggressive targets as well. And uh, I think we should uh, continue to have one development, um, one technology roadmap to meet these uh, standards. I do believe um, the industry is capable uh, with some form elect of electrification in the powertrain, uh, where you have mild hybrids or 48 uh, volt, um, which uh, definitely will help to meet CAFE standards. I think uh, capabilities are there. Do you think that uh, there might be some adjustments to the CAFE standard anyway? As you know, yeah. from 2022 to 2025, mm -hmm. The, the increase is yeah. quite steep. Yeah. And it seems to me, based on what I'm talking to people in the industry, they don't want that steep of yeah. an increase. Yeah. They just want it flattened out. They don't want to back off the final goal. That's right. They just don't want it to be ramped up so quickly. Yeah, I think that's uh, what currently is um, discussed and uh, reviewed at our customers. What is the uh, timing? Uh, what are the uh, um, engine programs which will switch to the new? Uh, standards which technology will come in at which time is already 2022 or 2025. Um, yeah, that that might happen, but some of these is already well underway and can't cha can't be changed. Mm -hmm. uh, we're already in mid of 2017. Yeah. yeah, and as you know too, the the standard does not change between now and the yes. year 2022. It yeah. gets stricter every year anyway. Lon, even though you're not directly in powertrain, I got to believe automakers are putting a lot of pressure on Intiva to come up with lighter weight components because that will improve fuel efficiency. Oh yeah, light weighting, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting because, um, you know, if you, look, if you look back over the years with oil crises and things like this, light weighting has been part of our industry for a long time. And there's always been a price point. The regulation does push that to the forefront. The technology in many cases, like Reiner says, is, is certainly there. Um, the speed of execution, I agree, I think mm -hmm. it could be uh, slowed down, even as a consumer. I don't, I'm not really sure we want to obsolete last year's fleet yeah. <laughs> with next year's fleet. But at the same time, I think uh, certainly the, the pressure on lightweight materials, lighter weight designs, more efficient designs, um, and, and I think uh, beyond that, I think the the real issue is we ha we have a global industry, and you know China's already demanding on pretty much the same time frame. I think it's 60 miles per hour or miles per, per gallon, gallon yeah. uh, as the equivalent standard with pushing electrification. Um, so I think the the vehicle technology is going to have to advance. Now, how fast you have to introduce those new technologies, how much cost gets absorbed by the the ultimate price of the product is argumentative, uh, but I, I think, to Reiner's point, I think the technologies are being developed or are already on the shelf that can get pretty darn close to what, what they need to get to, at least on the glide path, um, and then slow down that last ramp a little bit. So in this case, even though the automakers may complain of all the regulations, it actually helps both of your businesses. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, we love EPA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's great. Speaking of uh, new technology coming in cars, Lon, why, why don't we start with you on this? Autonomous cars. They seem to be right around the corner. We can debate on how fast that market segment will grow, yeah. but you know, already automakers are talking about throwing out the steering wheel, throwing out the, the pedals because the cars will be able to drive themselves. You make a lot of interior components. The interior of a car could even become far more important to, than it is today. What's your view of it? Oh, clearly, um, I mean, I, I tell my team all the time the, the beauty of autonomous cars is our product mix doesn't really care so we do interiors, we do roof systems, sunroofs, we do door systems, so it, windows and latches, and we do motors and electronics. So all of those products are going to be around for a long time, so long as there's 
something called a vehicle. Now, Star Trek has that thing that might put us all out of business, <laughs> but the transporter transport machine, thing, right? But, but I don't see that technology on the immediate. Yeah. Does autonomy affect your business at all, Rainer? Uh, not really. Maybe with uh, different drive cycles um, and different uh, load uh, conditions on the engine. Explain, explain that a bit, because I think that's a critically important point. Yeah, I think um, um, most of our engines are currently developed for uh, certain extreme conditions. It has to be up to 100 miles an hour, and it has to have a certain um, towing capacity and whatever. And with uh, autonomous driving, I do believe that cars are driven more in an optimal uh, load point. So the engine might become uh, less um, uh, loaded and um, we might um, be able to live with easier condition for the engine. Mm. Um, so, but who knows? But on the other hand, if a car is going to be shared and used more frequently, oh, then you're going to have to test for many more miles. That's, that's right. Or shorter life. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but um, uh, miles driven will increase uh, with uh, autonomous cars, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. If you can give uh, the keys to your kids and they can use it anytime, even if they are just uh, 12 or 14 years old, uh, will increase the miles good for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Lon, as cars get used more often, miles rack up, I got to believe this is going to affect interior design today too because nothing's really designed today for quick and easy replacement on the interior of a car. Yeah, I think it's going to there's there's probably multiple facets here, but certainly the quality, reliability and durability of the of the materials, the selection um, we already have seen kind of over the last 10 years a, a, a significant emergence of luxury interiors uh, even in lower uh, lower level cars. Um, my daughter's cruise has stitched uh, sections of the door trim, so there's there's just a lot more luxury being put in. And explain uh, that. What, what, why is stitched a big difference for those who aren't up on this? Well, st stitching and upholstered surfaces it, it gives it gives more of a a feeling of more of a feeling of a living room, if you will. More quality. Yeah, more quality, and you, you just feel more comfortable. And I think those surface qualities are going to actually emerge with autonomous cars to be very important, but also cleanability and mm. durability so that if, if I have multiple users coming in, I'm not going to want greasy footprints and handprints all over the place. So I, I think it's going to have to be uh, interchangeable you're going to have to have some good, strong durability. I mean, they're talking about cars maybe going a half a million miles or more. Um, the interior can, can withstand that. The door systems can withstand that. The sunroofs can handle it. <laughs> we just got to make sure the drivetrain Oh, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Rainer, how, how quickly do you think autonomy might spread? What, what's, what's your vision for the rollout? I think it will creep in. Every new car generation will have additional features and more reliable features. Uh, when I uh, remember the first time I had this um, lane departure warning, it was quite unreliable. In the meantime, it is reliable. Uh, even in, in rainy days, it's working. So I think it will, step by step, it will come in and we will enjoy more and more to use it. So it's not just uh, on one day. Mm -hmm. And Lon, how do you think it'll roll out? Uh, well, it's obviously, um, it's, it's going to roll out, I think, a lot. I personally think it's going to be a little bit slower than some of the prognosticators, certainly for the whole fleet to turn over. Um, it's going to take a couple decades, probably. Um, but the, the features, you know, the NHTSA's developed the five stages uh, that start with zero. Um, and, uh, but each one of those stages, the technology that goes with it, is is in development, you know. So um, I know Cadillac is proposing now that they're going to have essentially a level three capable vehicle, but they're not promoting it, that it's autopilot. It's not, mm -hmm. and no one should, right? right? I think we will see for a long period of time a coexistence of um, level zero and level three um, before we see level five going into consumer um, space. It will be one and a half, two decades, yeah. I would guess. It, though it's interesting, both the Ford Motor Company and Waymo, which is which came out of Google, are saying they're not going to do level three, they're jumping right to level four and level five, mm. cars that can drive themselves because they're worried about the handoff. 
when the car is in autonomous mode, now all of a sudden it tells the driver he or she has got to grab the steering wheel and take control. They say that scares them and they're just going to skip that stage altogether. It makes sense. I, you know, I, I never liked being nagged, you know, when, when I was a kid. I come home from delivering the newspapers, my mom would say, you got to mow the grass. I say, Mom, I'm tired. <laughs> you know, that's, this car is going to nag me. To hmm. Put your hands back on the steering wheel. I think, I think you keep your hands on the steering wheel the whole time. Let's jump to manufacturing technology. I, I'm curious to see how 3D printing, additive manufacturing, might affect your business. Is this something that you're playing around with, Rainer? Oh, yeah, absolutely. We do a lot of uh, 3D printing in our prototype shops. Um, and here, both plastic as well, aluminum. Uh, we have the first steel 3D uh, printing. See, that's amazing uh, to me that you can print yeah. objects in aluminum or steel. Yeah, but this is um, uh, nothing for mass production. The costs are currently prohibitive, and you have uh, several uh, steps before you um, uh, before we think uh, that is something for mass production. But if you are in small volumes, aftermarket, aerospace, um, racing, uh, I think it uh, gives a lot of more uh, design freedom, and it's fast. Uh, you can uh, you can have uh, the design on a computer, and the next day you have support. But it's only one part or two parts, but mm -hmm. not two thousand. Mm -hmm. Lon. Yeah, I think Reiner said it very well. I, I think uh, almost everybody is using 3D printing and prototypes and select prototype mm -hmm. opportunities. Uh, certainly low volume production service opportunities, past model service, you know, uh, those, some of those parts that are 30 years old and somebody's trying to restore their vehicle and it's very costly to hold on to all that inventory. And if we could take those old drawings and plug them in and be able to push a button and pump it's one real, out every real, five minutes, that would be kind of cool. The real benefit is you don't need tools. Yes. You just need a drawing in a mm -hmm. computer and then you, you're good to go. Do you see the day coming when 3D printing will adapt itself for mass production? Um, I can't see it uh, because uh, if you think about forging or uh, melting iron and uh, that's so highly efficient, um, there's a long, long way before uh, 3D printing will, will be able to compete. And, and of course, both of your companies make mass production volumes of everything that you make. So you're not involved in small lot production that much. We, we, no, we do have uh, some racing and we do have some um, uh, samples and prototypes. Um, but uh, for mass production, we don't even think about um, 3D printing currently. It's all about cycle time. Yeah. You know, if you can, if, if, if the technology gets developed to the point where it can match cycle time of an injection molding machine or a forging machine or a die caster, and then, you know. Then we might be talking might more be talking. 3D printing. Yeah. Okay, we've talked a lot about technology. Let's talk a little bit about the business these days. R Rainer, how do you see the automotive business? It looks like it's slowing a little bit in the U.S., but the rest of the world looks pretty good. Yeah, even see U.S., I mean, if you make this year again, 17 million, it's a very healthy level. Very healthy level, and yes, uh, growth is uh, slowing down. Maybe we will be flat this year, but 70 million is fine. And in Europe, we had a strong quarter one. The so European uh, demand is high. Uh, outlook for second quarter is good. Um, we we are heavily involved in heavy duty, and we see, with the exception of the U.S., we see heavy duty and industrial in a healthy position, um, especially as now raw material prices are coming up. We see a lot of mining activities restarting and that's good for industrial business. And uh, we have signals even here in the US, second half orders uh, might be uh, better for heavy duties than it has been currently. Oh, interesting, because heavy duty trucks can be a leading indicator Absolutely. for the economy. Yeah. And if you're saying it looks yeah. better in the second half, that bodes well. How about your outlook? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, it's pretty well aligned, I think. Uh, you know, if you look at the global economy again, uh, you know, China slowed down. Everybody's worried about China because China's only growing at four or five percent annually. Um, the U.S. market continues to plug along fairly nicely, and yeah, it might be flat year over year, but it's still a pretty healthy market. So, we're not seeing uh, a lot of stress there. there there's there's going to be spots where a particular model program might be going out. That's a big swing, but. You know, those, those things tend to kind of level out over the year. Um, but, you know, this, this industry, and I'm, my, my gray hair belies my youth, you know, it's, uh, 
it's it's always been cyclical and cyclical to the economy because it's a, still a big ticket item. So if something really bad happens that would affect the economy, you know, then yeah, you could you could see something go crazy. But right now there doesn't seem to be anything that's that I see as being a real big rock in the road. Rainer, do you have much business in China? Yes, we do. And um, what's your outlook there? Positive. Um, we had a very strong quarter one, um, much better than we thought after the tax uh, benefits slowed down. Uh, forecast for the second half of the year is a little bit slower, um, but still healthy, and um, especially on the heavy duty side, we are busy. Mm -hmm. Why do you think uh, truck sales, heavy duty truck sales, are slowing in the U.S.? Uh, I, I can't say this. I think um, uh, one of the reasons is clearly in construction and in uh, mining. Uh, this slowed down, but it will come back. It's a very cyclical business, by far more cyclical than automotive. Very good. With that, we're going to wrap this up. I want to thank both of you for sharing your view of what's going on in the industry on a whole lot of different topics, on a whole lot of different fronts, but I very much wanted to get the view from a couple of CEOs in the Tier 1 part of the business. Lon Offenbacher, Rainer Ustock, thanks so much for coming on AutoLine this week. Sure thank you very much. And I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for AutoLine this week has been provided by Borg Warner.